test. Test, test, one, two, one, two. Uh, if anyone's out there, can you let me know how the audio is coming in? Appreciate it. Hey Max, how you doing? Okay, thanks. Thanks for uh, letting me know audio is okay. So I'll be starting in about a, a minute or, or so, just trying to get some things together. Thanks again, Max. Appreciate it. Okay. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira, and this is our weekly live stream. So we're glad you could be here with us. We appreciate it. Um, full name, how you doing? Again, Max, how you doing? Um, I think it's Monday night for most of you, Tuesday morning for the rest of us. And... Um, it's going to be interesting to see how this this live stream is going to compete against the uh, Monday Night Football over in the states. So <laughs> that should be interesting. Hey Sean, how are you doing? Steve Porthouse, how are you doing? I'm um, glad you guys could could be here with us tonight. If it is your first time here, or if you are new uh, to to this live stream or to our channel, you know, go ahead and uh, subscribe. Or we please ask that you can subscribe and click on the bell to be notified on new updates and give us a thumbs up if you like what we do and of course you can find us on various places in social media our website excuse me our website is silverbullion.com.sg uh we are in singapore facebook silverbullion sg twitter at silverbullion pl pl once again private limited uh the audio versions can be found on bit.ly slash sbtv itunes slash sbtv spotify and you know, do join us on our Telegram group, Crisis Tracker, where you can log into Telegram and um, or add us at t.me slash Crisis Tracker. So those are the uh, various ways that you can you can find us or, or get a hold of us. So Pay Bar, uh, good evening for Seattle. Yeah, exactly. I just was going to say I, I uh, haven't seen your name before. So glad that you uh, that you made it. Hope things in the Northwest are going OK. Tom Johnson, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the, the feedback. Uh, Annette Walls, Middle Tennessee. That's a good place. I'm always seeing nice pictures and hearing good stories about the people there. So glad you could join us. Adam Jacob, good day. Aaron Razy, Razi, either one. Uh, glad you could be here. Yeah, first time I, I've noticed your, your name also. Joey Vargas, how's it going? Uh, Polynesian Pip, aloha. I hope, uh, hope everything's going okay. Um, <clears throat> again, glad all of you folks could could make it. Southwest Iowa, okay. Well, a pretty diverse group. So again, glad um everyone could be here today. Um, interesting things going on. I, I heard uh or I've read Trump had some type of a meeting with uh, Jerome Powell and Steve Nuchin that wasn't exactly scheduled or so. Um, you know, things going on in, in Iran, a lot of unrest all over the world, even in, in Hong Kong, there's some things going on with the, the college campuses there. A lot of places, a lot of things we can look at. Um, 
But first thing we're going to do is, is go ahead and take a look at the gold and silver price. I, I know that's probably on a, a lot of your, your minds. So it is Tuesday morning here in Asia and taking a look at silver price in U.S. dollars. It's 1708. Gold is 1474 in U.S. dollars. Nickel, nickel's come down a bit, but um, I, I think, you know, it, it still more than likely will turn around um it may be a, a decent opportunity to to get in but these are the, the current prices so you know we we have seen silver especially has been bouncing up and down quite a bit um as we can see here on this chart gold's been doing the same um so with those two metals you know i mean they seem to be reacting to whatever news comes out as far as the trade uh wars you know if, if it seems like Trade wars are going to subside or find a solution. We see it go down. If it looks like trade wars are, are still, you know, a, an issue, then we see it go up. So it's it's really, it really does seem to be bouncing around on, on whatever's coming out of the news lately. Uh, Paddy, hello from Indiana. Hey, how you doing? Glad you can make it. Fernando, oh, can't read that one. Uh, first time greetings from Portugal. How you doing, Fernando? Portugal, one of the places I need to get to in my lifetime. One day, we'll get there. Daniel Walls, Miami, how you doing? Joel Johnson, how you doing? A lot of new names, so we appreciate uh, we appreciate you being here. South Dakota, great, great, great. These are some uh, interesting places. That I haven't had a chance to go there. South Dakota would be interesting. I, I'd like to see the open plains and, and all the buffalo roaming around one day if I could. Oregon, how you doing? Normal norm. Okay. So, Ecuador, Chester, Kendra, Ecuador. Okay, how you doing? That's, uh, again, pretty diverse. Diverse people, diverse places. So, um, you know, let's take a look at some news. Another diverse place, uh, Lebanon. Kind of interesting. I, I just saw this uh, come out the other day where um, Lebanon Banking Association... Whoops, hang on. Agrees $1,000 weekly withdrawal cap statement. Is this another word for some type of capital control? Well, let's see. The association from Reuters, the Association of Banks in Lebanon agreed a set of temporary directives for commercial banks, including a $1,000 cap on weekly withdrawals from U.S. dollar accounts. The association said on Sunday amid a worsening economic and political crisis. The measures were to facilitate, standardize, and regulate the work of bank employees in light of the country's exceptional circumstances. It said following nationwide protests that have kept banks shut for most of the last month. The directives included permitting hard currency transfers abroad only to cover urgent personal expenses it said in a statement the measures did not represent restrictions on the movement of money and came in consultation with lebanon's central bank lebanon's bank staff union said it would extend to monday a nationwide strike that began a week ago and which has kept banks shut the union is set to meet monday to discuss a security plan intended to keep branches safe and allow them to reopen. The central bank has not set formal capital controls, despite fears of a rush on deposits and pressure on the pegged Lebanese pound in the informal market. Chaos all over the place. Uh, it, it, it's amazing. It's it's getting more and more difficult to find a place that is is not uh, under some type of duress. Uh, Adrian Sharp, good day from New Zealand. Uh, Robert Sapp, Tampa, Florida. Okay. Any relation to Warren? You know I've got to ask that question, right? Uh, let's see. Iran burning central bank building pay bar. You know what? I tried to look for um, news articles on that uh, just this morning and, and last night, and I'm not finding much of anything on the central bank building burning down. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, what's going on with, with that. Um, I do see protests. There is news about protests, but I did not see 
very much if any news about the central bank burning down. So I, I'm I'm kind of wondering either it's news that's being suppressed or or the news that I did find on that central bank burning down, 99% of it came from uh, pro Bitcoin, pro crypto websites. So I'm wondering if either one, it didn't happen, two, it happened and mainstream media is suppressing it, or three, is it just fake news that maybe these cryptocurrency websites seem to be pushing right now? Um, so go ahead and, and search. And I know for me, using DuckDuckGo, uh, what I found mostly was a lot of uh, cryptocurrency websites were, were posting the, the central bank burning, but I could not find mainstream media. So if you guys can find it, let me know. I, I'd, I'd be interested to know. Um, it's quite a statement if it's true. So Robert Sapp, no. <laughs> okay, you know I, I had to ask if uh, there was a relation to, to, to Warren. Okay, um, do you know, Tony Robinson, do you know about seed and coal? No, Tony, I don't. This is the first time I'm hearing it. I've you know, really been trying to uh, uh, spread myself thin, <laughs> finding all of the, these news for you guys. Uh, let's see. Pay wire Hong Kong protest is being suppressed also. Yeah, you know, that one, I think that one is a really, really delicate uh, situation um, uh, for a lot of people, uh, much more than just Hong Kong. Uh, you know, not, not saying it, it should be taken any lightly, but it's, it's a big thing for Hong Kong as well as China, as, as well as I think the, the rest of us, you know, we, we need to see how this is going to unfold. Uh, so let's see. The MSM will never report on central bank burning. Come on, Max. Well, I, I, I've been looking for it. I am, you know, it, it's, it's something at least for today, it's tough to tough to find. I, I thought that really would have hung on, you know, to being one of the, the top news, uh, articles coming off the weekend. Uh, but nonetheless, keep stacking, keep stacking. And, you know, something else that came up I on, on my Twitter feed, I caught a glimpse of Vladimir Putin talking about the dollar and uh, what he had to say. Um, sad, but true. Dollar использовать долларовые расчеты как инструмент политической борьбы, вводить ограничения на использование доллара. Своими руками начали пилить сук, на котором сидят, но скоро они грохнутся. Доллары сокращаются как резервная валюта во многих государствах мира. Иран ограничивает в долларовых расчетах, на Россию вводят какие-то ограничения, на другие страны. Это подрывает доверие к доллару. Неужели это непонятно? Своими руками уничтожают доллар. Okay, Mr. Putin had some pretty interesting things to say. Uh, he mentioned something along the lines like uh, one of the university, universal or global currencies or, or something along those lines. Um, I'm going to say the other, why he said one of, because perhaps the other is gold. And, and gold is, it is a currency. You know, make, make no mistake, it is, it is money. Um, not like how we knew it, but... It's still going to play a role. There, there's still a role for gold and silver to to play. No doubt about it. Uh, so let's see. Um, Joey Vargas. These trade wars, U.S.-China tariffs seem to have a parallel with the Smoot-Hawley tariffs, circa 2930. They crushed the global economy and added to the Wall Street crash and Great Depression. Okay, that is something I'll take a look at. Smoot-Hawley. Okay. Uh, full name, farm bailouts, bank bailouts, revising GDP lower than the U.S. has a good economy. You know, I'm seeing that uh, more and more, you know, um, either with uh, the Fed, you know, having their hand in mortgage-backed securities, um, having their hand in, in helping to wash the bank's balance sheets, um, and then speculation, where's the money going? Is it going to the farmers? Is it going to Deutsche Bank? Um, is it going to oil industry? There's... You know, so much right now because, because basically two reasons. One, things are not as transparent as they need to be. And two, we all know something is not right. We all know that already. And so again, that 
kind of leads us to um, speculate as, as to what's going on. And, you know, it, you can't really <clears throat> discredit much of anything right now. You know, you, you just have to take it in and see what it's at at, at face value and, and see if it, it really has has some merit to it. Um, but again, in, in speaking of this transparency, one thing that uh, that is surely needed is transparency. And so with that, I, I want to take you to this article where, um, you know, a lot of us want to know who's getting all of this money from the repo markets. Okay. But the thing is, from an article in uh, Zero Hedge, the Fed will not disclose which banks are receiving repo cash for at least two years. So we're going to have to wait two years before we know. Um, it, the crisis may happen before those two years are up, right? Uh, so this is something, you know, we're, we're going to have to keep our eye on. So this comes from Chris Powell of Gata. Uh, Chris is a, a great guy. He, he lays things out factually for you. And, and that's one thing I, I know a lot of us appreciate. Um, his article goes on to say, if you want to know which investment houses have been getting the infamous repo loans from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in recent weeks, as Gata has wanted to know, you will have to wait two years, according to a letter received from the bank today in response to Gata's request for the information. The delay, the New York Fed's letter says, is authorized by the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. Perhaps more interesting, interestingly, the New York Fed's letter signed by Corporate Secretary Sean Elizabeth Phillips contends that the bank is exempt from the Federal Freedom of Information Act but tries to comply with its spirit. So if you weren't sure if the Federal Reserve was a separate entity from the, the government, there you go. Uh, the bank is exempt from the Federal Freedom of Information Act but tries to comply with its spirit. So again, you know, Federal Reserve is not an entity of the U.S. government, much as you always hear. You know, it's like a Federal Express type of a thing. Uh, Federal Express, although it carries the name Federal, it is not a government entity. Federal Reserve carries the name Federal. It is not a government entity. So to go on a little bit more, such a claim of exemption was not made by the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors during GATA's F. OIA, Freedom of Information Act lawsuit, against it in 2011, in which Gata sought access to the board's gold related documents. Gata technically won the case when U.S. District Judge Ellen Siegel Kuvel ruled that one such document was illegally withheld and ordered the board to disclose it to Gata and pay the organization court cost of. $2,670. If you win a court case, you don't pay the fees for the guy who lost the case, right? So that's kind of what uh, this is saying, that the, the, the court fees were paid, which means got a one. So technically, that's, that, that's the argument that they're using. Uh, what kind of system of government is it when every week an entity created by Ordinary legislation can create enormous amounts of nation's currency and disperse it to unidentified parties without oversight by the people's elected representatives, news organizations, and ordinary citizens. It sure doesn't sound like the land of the free and the home of the brave. I'll end it there. I think you guys kind of get the, get the gist of it. Um, so let's see on. Uh, let's let's move on and let's see what else uh, is, is is going on in in live chat that you guys want to talk about. Uh, that means several banks have basically crashed. Well, you know it's uh, I I've been hearing you know some of that money has been going to Deutsche Bank. I've been hearing even HSBC is in trouble with with Comics and what they're doing with with the the gold rehypothecating it. So we're going to have to see how how that comes out. Also, that was uh, from. Uh, Craig Hemke, I believe. So if you have time, uh, try and find that one and, and have a read through it. Um, Rumpelstiltskin Wolf Richter says that interest rates may be forced to reverse, okay, as these low interest rates are killing banks. And the long end, the bond yield curves are wanting to push higher due to rising inflation. Well, we know that 
you know, it, it's no secret President Donald Trump does want lower interest rates. He's even mentioned negative interest rates. So we're going to have to see how that plays out. But the problem is negative interest rates, are, they're going to hurt savers. And, and um, you know, it's, it's a strange thing because you don't want to hurt savers for one thing going into, into an election, right? Uh, but it, it's it's a lot more than that. Um, we're just going to have to see how that plays out with the rest of the world or a lot of the world, you know, basically at low to zero to negative. Um, you know, it, it's it's difficult where the dollar needs to somehow find a way to, to compete and uh, the manufacturing base and all of these things need to find a way to compete. And so that's why we're looking at things such as, you know, uh, getting a weaker dollar president wanting lower interest rates and whatnot uh you know it's it's a race to the bottom you know central banks you know they've pulled their parachute they're drifting down slowly slower you know lower 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 and it's uh it's on the way down so we're again we're gonna have to see we're gonna have to see how this happens um let's see tony robinson america is owned by seed and coal red pill reports has a very interesting article that explains it in depth i know uh years back i came across these things where um you know uh, america has become a corporation or something like that where it, it is basically owned um but you know it's who knows who knows what's going on nowadays pablo pina how you doing uh creek comer just here for the giveaway yeah me too <laughs> i'm here for the giveaway too I think we got to create one, one, one day and see, see what happens. Right. Um, so let's see if, uh, every central bank goes to negative rates, where is growth going to come from? You know, I, I personally think if it all goes to negative, I, I think, um, we're going to have to be looking at probably socialism as well already. If, if it all goes to negative, there's not going to be much of anything anywhere where, you know, personal motivation to, to want to build and, and, you know, create some type of a legacy or, or future. If it gets to that point where people feel like there's nothing in it, no hope, you know, it, I think slowly it's going to turn and, and turn towards more of a socialist um, idealism. And, and I hope not, you know, I, I mean, there, there are things that, um, you know, we're, we're meant to do, you know, we, we need to, to thrive. We need to be inspired. We, we need to have that, that drive to move forward and, and again, build, you know, that, that needs to be there for us. Um, so anyway, besides the fed, not disclosing these, uh, repo recipients, you know, I found another, uh, interesting article that, that's still right up the alley of what we're, we're talking about where, you know, from Reuters, the U S fed, buys 1.8 billion sorry u.s fed buys 1.8 billion of mortgage bonds sells none okay so now the fed is in the business again of buying excuse me of buying mortgage bonds so let's take a look at this and then i'm going to show you something else uh federal reserve bought one point let's call it 1.8 billion of agency Agency now remember that word agency mortgage backed securities in the week uh, from November 7 to November 13. So this is fairly recent compared with 828 million purchase the previous week. Okay, so Fed is buying up agency mortgage bonds. Uh, the New York Federal Reserve Bank said on Thursday in a move to help the housing market begun in 2011 the u.s central bank has been using funds from principal payments on agency debt and agency mortgage-backed securities or mbs it holds to reinvest in agency mortgage-backed securities the new york fed said on its website the fed sold no or zero mortgage securities guaranteed by fannie mae FNMA and OB, Freddie Mac, FMCC.OB, or the Government National Mortgage Association, or Jeannie May, in the latest week. It sold none the prior week. Okay, so that, um, this is agency-backed, uh, agency mortgage-backed securities. So I want to go back and, and 
take a look at a website that we looked at last week, which is the New York Fed repo and reverse repo operations. So remember the Fed this the Fed uh, we, we just read about excuse me, agency backed uh, mortgage backed securities, okay? So reverse repo November eighteenth, we're seeing twenty seven billion. Sorry about that guys, bear with me. November eighteenth again, repo. We're seeing fifty five billion treasury agency. We're seeing one now, one billion. Mortgage backed, we're seeing four point five billion in the repo market repo market is where banks are supposedly having liquidity issues so they're selling off their treasuries and supposed to be repurchasing them from or to the federal reserve or from the federal reserve in exchange for cash or to get some liquidity so we see here 55 billion but they are also selling mortgage backed securities as collateral so again i brought this up last week so here we are 4.5 billion okay so we go again 6.3 billion along with the billion from the agency november 14 uh, november 14 sorry about that 11 billion mortgage backed okay the fed took in 11 billion okay so let's go down and, and i'm only taking a look at mortgage back seven billion rounded off about seven billion the fed is taking in okay so again i brought this up last week where why is the fed taking in so much mortgage backed securities as collateral nine billion okay nine billion i think if i add this up for for just november we're going to probably be close to about a, a hundred billion I, I haven't added it up yet 11 billion again so these things are, are adding up and why does it matter it matters because when we take a look at the fed's own website and we're taking a look at reverse repurchase agreements mortgage-backed securities sold by the fed in the temporary open market operations so this is what the fed is selling 2017 they sold 2017 november they sold when we come to the end of 2018 zero 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 all the way zero 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 you guys can see that right zero zero so the fed is taking in these mortgage-backed securities and they are not selling them okay so you guys see it right here it's all zero it's coming from the fed the fed's taking it in they're not selling it so you gotta ask the question here what's going on what well, what's your take why is the fed hanging on to mortgage-backed securities is it some type of investment or are they cleaning up bank balance sheets so this is something again we're going to have to watch we're going to have to keep on keep an eye on um let's see some of your uh questions in in live chat are are the fed just keeps doing the same stuck on stupid you know they they are doing the same thing you know a lot of us have already said that 2008 has never been cleared up it, it's just been kind of uh wiped a little bit you know but it's still it's still dirty it's there's still problem it's never been solved um monetizing debt yeah that's pretty much what it is but i think the difference for for me is you know in 2007 2008 you know it, it was the banks that was hanging on to these cdo's uh collateralized debt obligations that had the mortgage-backed securities wrapped up in them it was the banks that held them and when it got in trouble when these mortgages got in trouble the banks got in trouble uh insurance companies got in trouble as well this time around we're seeing the fed seemingly starting to take on these mortgage-backed securities and and so you got to ask the question if mortgages get in trouble this time around and it's the fed who's holding them well what happens then does the fed just go ahead and print more money I mean, it seems like uh, there, there's some type of a glass wall now between um, what happened in 2007 and, and 2008 and, and what might happen this time, might happen this time, where if the Fed is holding it, then what do they do? Just print more money and, and then that uh, takes the, the responsibility away from the bank. You know, I'm not 
entirely sure how this is supposed to work, but on the surface, it's what it kind of seems like, right? The Fed is helping to to wipe off banks' balance sheets right now through through the repo market. So we're going to have to again see what what's going on here. Uh, RR cleaning up bank balance sheets is my bet. It, it's it's mine too. Uh, Justice Texas got my pitchfork, nice and sharp. Okay. All right, I'll I'll be standing behind you. You can be in front of us. Uh, Fed propping up all asset bubbles, very dangerous. You know, yeah, we we can't deny that at at this point already. You know, the economy. I, I um, I think it's really hit a point where it's it's basically fantasy. And, and again, this is where we we need to watch out. And you know, this isn't some type of conspiracy stuff or anything like that. The I think most of us have already come to the understanding that the economy it's just not making sense at this point you know if economy is doing so well why did we have to lower interest rates if economy is doing so well why did uh why was there this meeting you know recently between uh trump newton and, and powell what was this unscheduled meeting about there's something going on in in the background and um you know it, it's it's just to say that we don't know. The transparency is not there. We're going to speculate, but I think it's safe to say we can speculate that the economy is not all as it seems. So we need to, again, be weary of that, and we need to be protecting ourselves as, as best we can. Um, let's see. Uh, Mark Howard, wait. What the Fed's dirty? I'm gonna, t <laughs> yeah, the Fed. They they have their, they they do their own thing, you know. Um, again, it, we we need to be watching a, a lot of things nowadays. We we can't take everything at, at face value, and and it's sad, you know. That that's sad when uh you, you can't put your full trust and faith, you know, anymore in in what you're being told from, you know, whether it be news organizations or whatever else, and um. You know, I want to play uh, another clip for you guys because I'm go what I'm going to go into is what Pablo Pena just said, CLOs. I'm going to start to go into CLOs. And, and what I'm going to do is go a little bit backward in time. And, and I want you guys to, to watch this clip. It's pretty interesting. It's a short clip, but it says a lot. The core problem with financial crises is that the only way to stop them and fix them is to do things that people view as unjust and immoral by doing a bunch of things that are tragically offensive to people. You know, when you got a big, ugly problem, the idea that you're gonna have some elegant solution just is a, a pipe dream. So you're trading off doing something that's really unattractive versus doing nothing at all, which may be worse. Do you think another crisis like 2008 could happen again? There's a set of rules. Then the industry innovates. And they come up with things that aren't covered by the rules. So you have to have new rules. And you have new rules and they work for a while, but then people find a way around it. So the next crisis will come when there's another innovation that gets around these rules. These crises are gonna happen again. And again, I think that's one thing that you learn when you go through that. The same crisis is almost certainly not gonna happen. Something else will, but not the same. I don't know any banker who can look at themselves today and say, you know, we didn't make mistakes yet. Most bankers at the time were as focused on helping provide a solution as they were just looking at their, at their own problems. People were trying to help each other. We were all trying to do the right thing for the country, and, and of course we were all part of the problem, but that doesn't mean you weren't going to try to do the right thing for the country. Okay, so um, will CLOs be that workaround for Wall Street, as uh, I think it was Barney Frank who, who was one of the authors of the, the Dodd-Frank uh, uh, legislation uh, to help regulate banks and what he had to say was um, it'll Dodd-Frank will work for now it, in a sense until they will find ways around it and with CLOs they are finding ways around it and I'll get into that shortly uh, I'll get into that shortly I just want to take a few more or look at a few more comments Excuse me, before I get into it. Um, Alejandro, it's coming again. Boys and girls, get ready for the NWO. Um, you know, it's 
something's coming, you know, and, and I think we know what it is, you know, some type of, uh, you know, new monetary system that that's going to be coming in and, and we got to find a way to, to get through that transition, which is the key part of this, this, uh, change over. Um, okay. So as Barney Frank said, you know, it, it it's going to work until basically wall street or bankers or whoever they find a way to, to get around it, which brings me to this article here where this is, um, last year, February, but still the warning signs were already out where the banks increased CLO or collateralized loan obligations forecast after Dodd-Frank court ruling. Okay. Banks are expecting increased U.S. collateralized loan obligations or CLOs fund issuance after U.S. court ruled that the funds will shortly be exempt from regulations that require managers to hold some of their deal. Morgan Stanley increased its 2018 U.S. CLO forecast by $10 billion to $110 billion following the decision, and Deutsche Bank raised its forecast to $120 billion from $110 billion, according to reports. Again, this is February 2018, but it, it already shows that these things are, are starting to move. The U.S. CLO market, the largest buyer of leveraged loans, cheered a decision by a U.S. Court of Appeals on February 9 that the funds will be exempt from Dodd-Frank risk retention rules which require managers to hold 5% of their fund. Removing the retention hurdle should help more firms to raise deals, especially smaller managers that lacked the required capital. Issuance is off to a strong start this year with 13.5 billion of CLOs printing through February, showing an increase of more than 700% in volume from the same period of 2017. CLO forecasts for 2018 were already strong, ranging from 90 billion to a record 140 billion, but some banks now expect the court decision to fuel even more funds. Citigroup kept its record $140 billion forecast in place, but increased its estimate for the number of deals that will be reworked the workaround. According to a February 20 report, the bank says $110 billion will be refinanced and $120 billion will be reset, up strongly from a January forecast of $60 billion of refinancings and $105 billion of resets. JP Morgan also increased its forecast for CLO financings and resets, raising it to $115 billion from $70 billion. Refinancing, refinancing is keep funds maturities in place but change the interest rate on one or more debt tranches, whereas resets extends maturities to allow CLOs to stay outstanding longer. Decreasing spreads paid to senior CLO debt holders increases the payout to investors in the most junior tranche Equity, as equity holders receive the interest left over after all other investors are paid. So there you go. Uh, there you go. So this is what uh, Barney Franks was, was warning about. Uh, one of the authors of the, the Dodd-Franks uh, legislation. CLOs, they are the workaround. CDO, uh, CLOs, they're similar to a uh, a CDO. And, uh, in fact, what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll go ahead and, and play a short clip on what exactly a CLO is. So we're all on the same page. Okay. Hang in there. Some bonds in the $680 billion market for collateralized loan obligations or CLOs fell 5% in October, showing signs of worry about rising risk in the complex debt instruments. So what is a CLO? Remember the mortgage-backed bonds that blew up in the financial crisis? Same thing, but instead of mortgage loans, they involve corporate loans to companies with below investment grade credit ratings. A CLO manager borrows money by issuing bonds, takes that money, buys up a bundle of loans. 
the cash flow that comes from the bundle of loans pays off the bonds and everything that's left over goes to the CLO manager. CLO bonds do resemble mortgage-backed bonds, but very few of them defaulted during the financial crisis, and that makes them attractive to investors. Prices are falling because some of the riskier loans that the CLO owns are falling in value as the companies that borrowed them start running out of cash. While CLO bond prices are falling, the price of junk bonds is still riding high, and that's an unusual disconnect between the two markets. The fall in CLO prices could mean that junk bonds, which have rallied 12% this year, could be ripe for a fall. The two markets typically trade in tandem with each other. This disconnect doesn't seem sustainable. Okay, so we kind of sort of understand CLOs now, right? Um, it's similar to CDO, where uh, a CDO or collateralized debt obligation, uh, let's just call it public debt. Uh, that was you and me, you know, when, when we took out a loan on, on our home or, or other things. CLO is now corporate, corporate debt. So you can imagine if, uh, if the mess public debt got us into, uh, you need to multiply that because corporate debt probably will exponentially be something a whole lot more than than what we saw back in 2008 um okay so let me take a look at more of your your comments before we uh before we we move on uh let's see glenn cooper i enjoy your channel thank you glenn have you heard anything about a new crypto coming out backed by gold and becoming the new global reserve set up by china yeah i have um i think probably a lot of us have uh, whether it's true or not, you know, we, we, we don't know yet that that's the thing. Um, I'll refer even back to Jim records records where he had mentioned, you know, China could create their own cryptocurrency backed by gold. And, uh, the world will like that because now there, there's something backing the money again, and it's going to be a private, a private type of, a, a cryptocurrency where they will invite who they want to to have or use it or trade with it and they will not invite who they don't so you know if it is something that china does come out with or anyone for that matter you know it, it's it's a huge huge um problem for any country you know especially if it becomes some type of a gold back private crypto by a major economy and um this goes back to the first interview i had with daniel de martino booth and, and i asked her if we're going to see some type of a fed coin crypto coin her reply though for different reasons her reply was for national security we're going to have to and um we know whether it's something to stay on offense or go on defense you know i do think we're going to have to move into some type of government backed crypto uh, and probably or go not government backed but gold backed crypto because that is the way you're going to get other uh you're going to have confidence in your money again once you once you do that. So I do think that is that is the future, and um, of course it's going to be tied into to blockchain as as well. That that's the bigger part. You know, blockchain is, um, for lack of a better term, blockchain is everything. You know, that is that is the key to to just about any any type of uh, cryptocurrency since. Just about everything goes on that that blockchain, so that that's the key as as well. Um, let's see, old world order SDR is just a basket of currencies. Full name that that's true. Um, the SDR it, it is a basket of currencies. Um, U.S., Japan, Europe, uh, U.K., gold, and you know they also included uh, China. I might be missing one or two, but you know getting back to CLOs, you know they've They've already found the workaround, and that was through that uh, ruling where CLOs are exempt from Dodd Frank, and that opens up the door for banks to to do whatever they want to do again. Or I shouldn't say whatever they want to do, but it, it opens up the door for for banks again to to um to really pile in uh, on CLOs. And, and you know we're already seeing that. I pointed out a few articles already where all these banks are upping their forecast. You know in in the CLO market. But I do need to give the other side of the coin where um, some guys say CLOs are okay. You know, 
don't worry about it. We're, we're in top shape. Don't worry about the CLO. So th this is about a three minute or so, so. So bear with me. It's still good information. Thomas, CLOs are similar in some ways to what we remember from 2007, 2008, CDOs. Explain to me what's different and help us understand before we bombard you with that, you know, the danger signs, why we shouldn't be afraid of CLOs. Sure, other than the acronym sounding pretty similar, the, the differences pretty much are, are quite wide from there. Um, CLO stands for Collateralized Loan Obligation and they're securitizations of assets that are small pieces of large secured loans to American companies. These are not subprime mortgages or to no documentation borrowers. These are the large companies we do business with every day, Dell Computer, Altice Cable, American Airlines. But within the tranches you've yep. just described, similar to a CDO, yep. there might also be groupings of, for instance, auto loans. Absolutely not. No? No. Why not? Because, is, because the Bloomberg all, article said it was. It's all corporate credit. Small, only pieces, corporate, okay. small pieces of big loans to big companies is what typically makes up a CLO. What typically makes up a CLO. Yeah. What percentage of the market, though, is uh, companies that are rated, I mean, are there junk rated companies whose debt is in these as well? Uh, nearly all of them, actually. So the, the loans that go into CLOs are below investment grade rated. Mm -hmm. um, they're typically um, one ETF that's quite common that some people might own is BKLN, which represents about the largest 100 loans in the market. These are typically double B and single B rated corporate credit. But because they're secured and that we have a pledge of all of a company's assets, unlike high yield bonds which are unsecured, despite being risky loans or junk quality loans, 25 out of the last 27 years, the leveraged loan index has had positive returns. Is this stuff that you guys well, are in? We're not in leveraged loans, but um, we invest in the high yield bond market. And one of the mm -hmm. things we've been concerned about is just the increasing leverage that we've seen generally across the corporate market. Um, and particularly if you look at triple C performance, it's starting to show that the market is getting a little bit worried about that as well. So, um, and the only thing I, the only other thing we worry about a little bit about the overall corporate credit quality health is that, um, you know, there's a lot of anecdotal stories about uh, covenant light deals in the loan market. And Which the, and means if you, what? So this, um, and you can probably explain this better than I can, but um, you know, the documentation that, that um, is required that companies have to adhere to certain things, financial performance and other things, is a lot lighter in a lot of these newer deals. Um, so I guess the proportion of covenant light deals is like 70% of the market now versus a decade ago or it's, something? It's a fundamental shift and it's actually the loan market catching up to the high yield bond market and that for the last 50 years, high yield bonds have been covenant light. Right. That the moniker has never been applied to the bond market. But what it means is simply companies no longer have ongoing financial maintenance requirements. As long as they pay their interest currently, there's not a concept of technical let me, default. Let me give you, so let me give you the last word, because you know, the buyers going in should know these are not you know, AAA rated tranches that they're buying. Mm -hmm. What happens if the worst case scenario, the company goes under? How do I, if I'm part of a tranche of a CLO, do I get made whole? Well, if a company defaults, it will go through a bankruptcy process and the secured lenders are the first in line to be repaid. So typically the loan would get all or substantially all of its money back prior to the high yield bonds, which are unsecured, getting any money back. Um, historically, loans have recovered 80 cents on the dollar when they default. So the performance of the asset class is really quite strong. And then CLOs own these very good quality loans, albeit with low ratings, mm -hmm. in a very stable structure that's allowed to reinvest. And this is the most important piece of the puzzle. And the CLOs issued on the eve of the financial crisis in 2006 and 7 turned out to be the best performers for the equity of the CLO. Not that they didn't have credit problems. We had mm -hmm. plenty of credit problems, more than the market would like. But paydowns on loans and amortization payments and recoveries could be reinvested when no one else was buying. Hmm. And that proved to really be the best for this market. You've made a bit of a case here, and next time we're going to get Sheila Bear in here to go over ah. that. She, <laughs> she's raised a red flag about him. I look forward to Thomas it. Thomas Majewski so. from Eagle Point Credit Management. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, so this gentleman is saying we, we don't need to, to worry about this. Uh, but, you know, our, our last guest, Kevin Smith, he, he mentioned ratings agencies you know they are having a pay-to-play tendency and um should we believe everything will be okay with clos and, and and their ratings as this uh gentleman is saying that you know we don't need to worry about 
CLOs. Um, you know, for for myself, I've heard this before. You know, we didn't need to worry about CDOs. Look at what happened. You know, so I, I'm not really buying the the full case of we don't need to worry about CLOs and um, where secure lenders will be the first to to get paid should should these CLOs falter. Well, you and me, we're not we're not that guy. You know, we're we're on the bottom of of the totem pole here, where you know we're the guys that are going to be stuck holding the bag again, and. Uh, so again, you know, we, we really start to see a, a disconnect between the way, you know, bankers think and, and, and um, the way the, the people on the ground um, think. You know, we're really starting to, to see this, this disconnect. Um, so anyway, I want to take a look at a few of your questions. Uh, Patty, Silver Bullion, the new system will be blockchain. They will, re they will monetize everything so they can sell interest rate insurance on everything this gives insurance companies no liability you know what I, I i'll believe that because basically there's no liability for anyone right now you know banks uh, you know the banks companies whatever it is there, there just doesn't seem to be any type of liability anywhere um so okay so let's see uh, a few more of the the questions um let's see i'm curious what everyone here thinks what percentage of your overall portfolio is allocated toward precious metals, specifically gold and silver, as I see them as being monetary metals? You know, Patrick, that, that's a good question. Uh, consensus is all of these experts, they, they tend to say 10%. And the reason is because, you know, you may as well ride the market on the way up, but be sure to, to have um, that gold and silver there just in case it goes down, because when it goes down, that gold and silver is going to go up exponentially. That's what a lot of people are, are, are thinking. But having said that, for you guys out there, and I'm going to say this again, I, I say it every live stream, if you have a 401k, you've been looking at your statements, you've been seeing that 401k go up. It's not going to go up forever, okay? It, it may be a good idea to, to start talking to some type of a, a, an IRA company as far as having a SD IRA, self-directed IRA, and and look at things like having a, a precious metals IRA account. Reason being, you know, when, when we say these things like 10% of your portfolio, and for some of you out there who are thinking, oh, this is just for these really rich people. No, this is probably specifically for you more than, than anyone else, where if you, if you do have a 401k, you already have money. It's not like you're going to be opening up your wallet to buy precious metals. You already have that 401k. The money's already there. You can take part of it, roll it over into a self-directed IRA, and go ahead and have that precious metals IRA account. That way, if the economy should go bad, which all of us more or less are expecting it to, to happen, you essentially took some of your chips off the table, and you're not going to take as big, as, as big a hit as you might otherwise take if you leave everything in your 401k just the way it is so you know if you hear you know the this talk 10 percent of your portfolio it's also you you with the 401k the average joe the day-to-day week-to-week month-to-month it's also it, it's also about you you know you you have you have that uh probably a fair amount in your 401k where you can do something with it to to help you look into getting a uh, precious metal IRA that that would be uh, my comment it's not financial advice it's just my comment because when 9-11 happened my 401k took a hit uh, a few tens of thousands I lost uh, when 9-11 happened not to take anything away from the lives that were lost uh, I'm just saying from my experience that's what can happen with a 401k so you have an out you can take some of it out put it into a precious metals IRA and uh, feel a little bit uh, safer in knowing that that's going to be there for you. Um, again, I'm, I'm always going to preach this because I know what happened to me. And I don't want that to happen to, to you guys. Okay. Um, okay. So again, taking a look at some of your, uh, some of your, your comments. Uh, can physically keep my gold in a SD IRA or a third party storage? As far as I know, this is Joel Johnson. As far as I know, it, it you, I don't believe you can transfer what you have now into 
uh, on IRA. I think it it's going to be something totally separate where, where you can't, uh, you know, I have this gold here, put it in my, my IRA. It, it doesn't entirely work like that. Um, but the best thing you can do is contact a, a company. Um, for us, we don't have any affiliation. We're not promoting uh, th this company called New Direction, uh, New Direction IRA. We're not promoting them, endorsing them in any way, but we do have clients that use this company and no complaints. You know, our clients have no complaints about this company. So I, I'm just forwarding that info to you. Again, we're, we have no affiliation with each other. I, I'm just sharing what seems to be working for some of our clients. So um, if you want, you know, go ahead and, and look up New Direction IRA uh, on the internet and uh, maybe contact them and ask them the, the questions that, that, you, that you need to know. Okay, let's see. Tom Harvey, I hear the problem with PM ETFs is they are oversold, uh, paper, metal, no access. It's like fractional metal on paper. Yeah, that's um, the paper market is, is just, it's insane right now. It, markets altogether as a whole, you know, it, it's just starting to not be believable anymore. And, and you know, uh, again, this is why we need to protect ourselves. And, you know, one of the obvious choices, tried and true, been around forever, basically, is, is gold and silver. That's your store of wealth. Um, uh, again, you know, I mean, I don't think we can, we can, we can say that enough, you know. Um, okay, so the thing is, do, do we believe this, that, you know, things are going to be okay with CLOs? And again, for me, I, I don't. I mean, it, it surely looks like the, the writing's on the wall. And, and I'm going to go through a few more uh, um, articles that, that are, are saying this. In fact, even the, the IMF is warning about CLOs, okay? The IMF. So this is from October 16th. It, it's fairly recent where the IMF and FSB warn of excessive U.S. corporate risk taking and deteriorating leverage loan quality. All right. So let's see what this article is about. The IMF, the IMF's Global Stability Report has serious warnings about significant financial stability vulnerabilities in the U.S. and the rest of the world. IMF researchers' analysis shows that if a major economic downturn occurs, corporate debt at risk of default would rise to $19 trillion, or nearly 40% of the total debt in eight economies. This is why I said CDOs, that was public debt. CLOs is corporate debt, which looks to be exponentially larger. The IMF report bluntly pointed out that surges in financial risk taking usually precede economic downturns. All right. As this author has published before, American companies have been borrowing at record levels. If that borrowing were to expand their businesses and to pay workers higher wages, I would not be as worried. This is when debt can be good debt, when you can turn it around and use that debt to, to make a profit for you. Uh, she goes on to say, what U.S. companies have done since 2017 is increase dividend payments, buybacks, and share, there you go, and share buybacks while reducing capital expenditures. It's very difficult to grow a company in a sustainable manner while reducing capex. One or of significant concern is that companies with below investment grade credit quality, which is what the gentleman just spoke about in the video before. In other words, they have a greater probability of default and have taken on more debt to increase shareholder payments. Investors and rating agencies should be very attentive to how this level of debt could lower companies' credit quality. A few days ago, the head of the Financial Stability Board, Randall Quarles, wrote to G20 Finance Ministries and Central Bank Governors that the FSB is conducting an analysis of the leveraged loans and collateralized loan obligations markets. He lighted areas of potential concern as being high levels of corporate debt, weaker lending standards, and creditor protections. 
as well as increased complexity and opacity, which makes it difficult to accept to assess potential spillovers and risk from interconnectedness and concentration of risks in a few big financial institutions additionally the author wrote the u.s government accountability office has just begun an audit of how u.s financial regulators are monitoring leveraged loan markets okay so i think we we kind of get the the gist of what this this author is saying as as well um you know it, it's clos they're they're a big deal okay they're a big deal and, and there's something that that we we need to watch and, um, you know, there are cracks that are forming. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at some of those also. Um, you know, it, this came from an article, I believe, from Bloomberg. Uh, yeah, from Bloomberg, where cracks forming in leveraged loan market as another deal pulled. Okay, so let's see what this says. The froth may not be off leveraged loans just yet, but with five deals... Falling through in the past few weeks, the market is definitely a little less giddy. This time, it's Viewed Software, the streaming service provider, joins marketing firm Golden Hippo, Glass Mountain Pipeline Holdings, LLC, Chief Powered Finance, LLC, and Fitness Center Builder, Lifetime Incorporated, in dipping its toe in the water and finding borrowing conditions too cold. Okay, in fact, you know what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll just play the... um the video that that's accompanying this article and, and, and let you folks take a look at that. Molly, what's going on? Talk to us about these five deals in particular. What is it signaling that investors are starting to get worried about? This is definitely the riskier part of the loan market. We've seen a ton of issuance in loans. Like even earlier this month, like deals were going perfectly as planned. Like generally when you see commitments due, deals will price within a day or so of that. And that was largely happening up until a couple weeks ago. But these are deals where uh, that have not been able to get priced as the terms have been very aggressive. Investors have been pushing back, asking for better pricing, and ultimately the loans have fallen through. Is this a seasonal issue? or do you think this is much more structural? People really see a shift in the market, in the economy. It's definitely where you're seeing like the demand that's lacking. It's mm -hmm. a structural problem here that these are like riskier loans that when you're looking at where we are in the economic cycle and thinking about maybe rates are being cut again next month and that's obviously lowering the demand for floating rate securities. But on top of that, we have a potentially we uh, worsening economy and, you know, weaker data that's coming in. And that's not a positive for like when you're looking to take on risk in your asset class. Obviously, mm -hmm. we've also been seeing a record a uh, record streak of outflows and loans, 39 straight weeks of outflows, which has just made a lot of investors pretty uneasy about the asset. Retail money's coming out. You've still got the ongoing buyer that is the yeah. collateralized loan obligation, the CLO, yeah. the structured vehicle that buys up this sort of stuff. But will, is there therefore demand for the slightly less risky area of leveraged loans? Is it just the very bottom part that are really going for it that are sort of being pushed to one side? Well, that's exactly where the CLOs have a bit of trouble stepping in to prop these up, that they too have limits of how much risk they can take on and how low in the capital structure they can go. So when, they don't, when you don't have your main support propping you up and then you're relying on the rest of the investor market that you know, is concerned for all of these other economic reasons, and that's reason to see that the demand's going to fall. Because some of the name, I mean, to Caroline's point, I mean, some of the names that we've seen here, I mean, they're, I mean, not to say they're shaky, but these are kind of companies where you would have doubts about them, whether they were doing a leverage loan or unleveraged, whatever they were doing. Sure. I mean, this isn't Apple going out there and saying, you know, we're going to back up this loan with our <laughs> iPhone sales. It's very, very far I mean, from Apple. Golden Apple, <laughs> Viewed Software, yeah. Lifetime, was it Lifetime Fitness? Lifetime Fitness, yeah. Uh -huh. A lot of it is private equity involvement, which yeah. Caroline's point, you know, that's really where we've seen so much of the aggressive issuance. And that's why you see a high yield by contrast has been very right. high quality issuance this year. Okay, so <clears throat> that was Bloomberg kind of saying that there are some, some cracks going on. And uh, of all institutions that is also seeing cracks going on it's u.s lawmakers they're actually doing some work where they want better oversight of risky corporate loans uh, experts say time is now to figure out where the risk sits okay so let's go through this article as u.s lawmakers are joint are joining the call for better oversight on the booming leveraged loan industry some experts warn they better hurry 
It better hurry before the next downturn. Last week, a subcommittee of the U.S. House Financial Services Committee held a high-profile hearing on leveraged loans to study the explosion of debt owed by U.S. by weaker U.S. companies in the past decade and to see if it could pose systemic risks. A leveraged loan is a loan extended to companies that, it, that already have considerable amounts of debt or poor credit history. Several witnesses at the hearing drew parallels between today's leveraged loan market and the proliferation of subprime mortgages in the run-up to the financial crisis, according to written, to, uh, written testimony. But a key takeaway was that lawmakers want better oversight of leveraged loans before, before there's trouble. It's the people who are unsuspecting and have nothing to do with Wall Street who are the people who will get hurt in a downturn. For me, a core message from the hearing was that regulators really need to have their finger on the pulse of what's going on, uh, said a, a professor at University of Colorado who specializes in financial regulation and testified at the hearing. Market discipline is deteriorating and oversight is deteriorating. Uh, it's sort of like turning off all of your instruments just at the point you are flying into the storm. The sheer growth in leveraged loans over the past dozen years has stoked fears that any fallout from debt laden companies in the next recession could spill into other sectors. The size of leveraged loan market has doubled to nearly 1.2 trillion from 550 billion back in 2007. So when that first crisis hit, we were at 550 billion and today it's at 1.2 trillion. So that, that's a huge, uh, that's a huge amount, huge difference from then. That still makes leveraged loans less than 5%, <clears throat> less than a 5% slice of overall U.S. fixed income. Okay, so let me go down a bit more. Um, like mortgages, the bulk of leveraged loans are bundled up and sold as classes of bonds, a process that can spread risks far and wide, but makes tracking where all those pieces a little bit harder. Currently, the single biggest buyer of leverage loans are funds called collateralized loan obligations that issued bonds with a 62% share of the market, according to Moody's. So here we are, CLOs over half. It's a huge, huge part of the market right now. Uh, CLOs, unlike subprime mortgage CDOs, have a stronger track record, even though the global financial crisis, or, or even though even through the global financial crisis, but the loans that underpin CLOs have gotten riskier. There are also more CLOs than ever before, including those in retirement savings accounts, mutual funds, and pension plans to help boost returns. Are we getting that? More CLOs than ever before including those in retirement savings accounts, mutual funds, and pension plans to help boost returns. I think that's more than, than, than we need to know, is that our pensions are in there, our, our retirement savings accounts are in there, our mutual funds are in there. And again, this is why I say, if, if you got the 401k, or if you have the means to, to roll over whatever your retirement is into some type of precious metals IRA, Go ahead, make the call, and, and get information on it because this thing is, it's, it's bigger than a bubble. <laughs> if there's anything bigger than a bubble, this, this is it. Uh, there are a lot of bubbles out there, but this, this is a, a pretty huge one. So we need to, um, we need to make sure that, that we're, we won't be affected uh, or, or minimize how we're going to be affected because we are going to be affected. So minimize it in, in some way. If you can, uh, some of the, the comments again, let me take a look. Um, let's see where we're at. Uh, RR, they've created a fake world that is detached from reality. You know, to them, it is the reality. Um, they, they're living just fine in it. It's, it's you and I who, um, who need to understand their world because, you know, Ultimately, it 
probably is going to end up going their way. So we need to, again, understand what's going on and how we can best uh, protect ourselves and, and, and our families. Again, as I always say, you know, we have time right now to to be that blessing instead of a burden when, when these things happen. You know, we're, we're all in this boat together. We need to understand what we need to do. But before we can understand what we need to do, we got to understand what's what's going on. And, and I know you guys are getting bombarded with news, you know, from the left, from the right, you know, top, from the bottom. You're hearing all these things and you're not sure, you know, what to make of it. I, I understand, you know, I, I get it. But we have to go through it and, and sift it, you know, sift all of this, this news that, that's coming through and, and in the end make a decision that, that can best help us through it. Um, you know, so... Uh, again, CLOs, we, we need to, to watch this. Our, our pension plans, yeah, that that is, it's in there, your pension. We had a live stream a few weeks back where a pension is just a promise. A pension is just a promise. We're seeing a lot of pensions that are underfunded. Um, underfunded, which basically means either government is going to have to get bigger uh, because it's sort of a Ponzi scheme where they need to get more people in to contribute or they're going to tax you more to be able to contribute to these pensions, or they are going to cut the pensions. Uh, those are probably the three things off the, that, that, that are tops on, on the chart of what they're going to do. You know, they have to hire more government workers to bring in pensions or pay into the pensions. Uh, they're going to have to, again, maybe cut pensions. It, it's that uh, again, you know, it's, it's not looking too good, but, we just have to do what, what we can do and, and, and what we can, what we can understand, uh, more like bailout plans, you know, it, it is, it, and, and that's a pretty interesting point because, you know, when we saw 2007, 2008, we, there was a new word that we heard too big to fail. You know, I, I don't think we've heard that word before too big to fail. We learned that there were companies or banks too big to fail. And it's almost as if, yeah, I mean, no proof to this, but it's almost as if a lot of these corporations realized, hey, well, we're too big to fail as well, you know, so why not, you know, hey, let's take these risks. We don't need to worry. We'll get bailed out as well. I mean, can you imagine, uh, uh, can you imagine the, the government letting GM fail to nothing, letting Ford fail to nothing, letting Boeing fail to nothing? Can, can you imagine these, these, these things? It's hard to imagine, right? So, it's almost as if these companies are too big to fail and, and they know it. So, you know, take on more risk. Why not? They're going to get bailed out and, and at our expense. So, uh, again, the, just things to, to keep an eye on. Um, let's see. Uh, are, are they keep changing their own rules. It makes hard to play their game. They do keep changing, and that's why we got to kind of, kind of keep up to speed with it. Uh, Trump tweeted the stock market and pensions are correlated saying if I go the stock uh, basically if if uh, if he goes the stock market is going to go and so does the pensions you know he's um he's right in a sense if that stock market goes down you're you already know what's going to happen to CLOs you know <laughs> CLOs are are they're going to get in trouble your 401k is going to get in trouble. Your pension is going to get in trouble. All these things are, are going to get in trouble. And again, this is why, you know, you have to look at things like gold and silver. I know already most of you do. It's not something you look at the everyday chart. What's the price now? What's the price now? What's the price now? That is just, that's the beginner level of gold and silver. When you understand it a bit more, you understand how it's that hedge. It's that store of wealth for you. You know, it, it's, it's generational wealth. Um, you understand how it's that insurance for you. And, and, and you know, it, it's way above and beyond just what's the price today? What's the price today? Get a little bit deeper into why people look at gold and silver because it's not just the price. There's a whole lot more to it than, than just that. Um, okay, so, you know, there was someone, I, I know you folks know who she is. She said that there, no need to worry. You know, there's not going to be another uh, financial crisis in, in our lifetime. Uh, remember this? When Janet Yellen had said uh, she expects no new financial crisis in her lifetime. And uh, 
U.S. Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen said that this is a bit dated, but she doesn't believe there's going to be another financial crisis for as long as she lives because of the reforms of the banking system since the 2007-09 crash. And, you know, it, it she had every reason to, to fully believe what she said. But if you take a look at the words closer, thanks largely to reforms of the banking system. So again, if you go back and you look, um, you look at it, this pertains most likely to, to Dodd-Frank, okay? But what we just talked about earlier was how they are working around the reforms of the banking system. So it kind of lends to, to the question, if there were no reforms, would Janet Yellen have said, you know, there's uh, no new financial crisis going to happen in, in her lifetime? So just to revisit her words, would I say there will never, ever be another financial crisis? Yellen said at a question and answer event in London. You know, probably that would be going too far, but I don't think we're much but I do think, excuse me, but I do think we're much safer and I hope that it will not be in our lifetimes and I don't believe it will be. Yellen said it would not be a good thing if reforms of the financial services industry since the crisis were unwound and urged those who had helped manage the fallout at that time to be vocal in preventing such a solution. So again, the main take from this, Yellen said it would not be a good thing if reforms of the financial services industry since the crisis were unwound. And again, this is what is happening with that, uh, that ruling in the appeals court where CLOs are now exempt from Dodd-Frank counted as being unwound. So. Uh, again, these regulations, they, if not being unwound, they're being skirted, they're being worked around. Um, what, what can you say? You know, th this is exactly what's, what's happening. Uh, taking a look at your, your comments again. Um, let's see. Um, hang on. Moving the goalposts again. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. Uh, Glenn Cooper, I suppose it comes down to trust. And Glenn, it always does, my friend. Um, it always does. And, uh, you know, that's where I go back to, to Rick Rule, how he uses this little, this little meter, a little needle. Is it closer to something or closer to something else? So when it comes to trust, are we able to trust the world and our government more? Or are we able to trust the world and our government less and if your needle is pointing to less uh, again you need to to do the things that that can uh help you out um, especially uh financially because that that's really going to be the one um you know when when people uh there are going to be a lot of people who may have uh you know hard times coming ahead and you know could be you could be me could be a lot of us but that's where again we try to take on you know, the understanding of what gold and silver can really do for us. And, and you can't say enough of what it can, can actually do. So, you know, question now is, is who holds these, these CLOs? And, uh, this is from S and P global. It was published just a few months ago, 21 June of, uh, 2019. These 700 billion in CLOs, who holds them? What risk? Do they pose? Uh, so the flourishing market for collateralized loan obligations has come under increasing scrutiny of late by U.S. lawmakers and regulatory agencies who say they are concerned about the $700 billion in outstanding CLOs potentially could pose considerable risk to the broader financial system. Some have even equated the market segment of collateralized debt obligations slash mortgage-backed securities widely cited as a major contributor to the 2007-2008 financial crisis. CLOs are a special purpose vehicle 
set up to invest in, hold and manage pools of leveraged loans. Their popularity has skyrocketed over the past decade, along with the broader U.S. leveraged loan market, which now holds a record, now holds a record 1.2 trillion, according to LCD. Um, we know 90 billion of the 700 billion in CLOs, or 13 percent, is held by U.S. banks. Okay, 13 percent being held by U.S. banks. But what about the remaining 87%? So one of these, these lawmakers had asked that question. So I guess we'll take a look into it. Starting at the top tier of the CLO structure, banks comprise some 45% of the buyers in the AAA-rated tranches of newly issued CLOs, while money managers make up 30% and insurance companies 20%. Mutual funds and pension funds account for less than 5%, according to city research. Uh, let me let me go down a bit. Um, let's see. Let me go down and see if we can find something a little bit more uh, significant. Uh, let's see. Sorry about that, guys. I just, I, I couldn't... Uh, mark this uh u.s banks hold about 90 billion uh banks in the u.s collectively have amassed about 90 billion of clo holdings as previously highlighted by fed governor leo Brainard at a presentation for the peterson institute um let's see wells fargo largest domestic bank buyer of clos 34.6 billion uh, JP Morgan is next, 20.5 billion. Citigroup next, 18.1 billion. Uh, other banks, Stifle Financial Core, Bank of New York Mellon, TD Group Holdings, uh, a few others. Uh, Bank of California. Um, okay, um, let's see. Among the different insurers, life insurance companies held the majority at 94 billion, followed by property and casualty insurers at 24 billion and health insurers at 3.5 billion okay that that i think that's the part i wanted to to bring up where insurance companies are in this and we know what happened last time when an insurance company got involved in at that time cdos this time we're seeing insurance companies involved in clos so you know for me i find that a bit concerning that insurance companies are, are going to go into this market uh, again, especially because we know what happened last time around with, with AIG. And, um, you know, last but not least, even the BIS, Bank of International Settlements, is scrutinizing loan or, or booming securitized loan markets has echoes of financial crisis. The BIS is, is warning us. Lending standards in the rapidly growing loan market are deteriorating and complex financial products that ma that mask risk to banks have parallels with the run-up to the 28 financial crisis. The number of CLOs, a form of securitization which pulls bank loans to companies, has ballooned in recent years as investors hunt for high returns by buying into loans to lower-rated and riskier companies like the collateralized debt obligations or CDOs that bundled U.S. subprime mortgages into complex products and were blamed for triggering the global financial crisis. CLOs also have complex structures that can mask underlying risks. The BIS said there were important differences between CLOs and CDOs that made the former less risky, but it warned that the scramble by investors for higher yields was leading to worsening standards that could trigger bigger losses in the future. So who do we have warning us? Janet Yellen is saying if, if, if regulators unwind what they put in place, we can. There, there's a possibility again of, of another crisis. We have the IMF who has come out and talking about CLOs. We have the BIS who is coming out and talking about CLOs. It, you know, this is a thing that a lot of people are are starting to to talk about, perhaps more than than ever. Um, and it's something we we all need to to understand. Um. Take a look at a little bit more of the, the live chat. So it's getting close to that time where, where I need to uh, head out. Uh, Mick, I will be real upset if the populace allow 
the central banks to create the reset of our monetary system. You know what, Mick? It, it, it's going to happen, my friend. Um, you know, even Christine Lagarde, when she was with the IMF, you know, she's already on record as, as saying, you know, global economic reset. You know, there is going to be a reset. We are going to need or we're going to venture into a new monetary system. Um, that is pretty much a certainty, my friend. Um, and, and again, this is where we, we're going to need to to know how to how to uh, how to avoid it. So, you know, one more thing, you know, before we leave today, just to make sure we all understand CLOs, uh, because it is something I think we're going to hear a heck of a lot more down the road. Uh, I'm going to play one more clip just to get an understanding, a better understanding of CLOs, because this is one thing we all need to know before we before we walk away from this this live stream today. It's a Wall Street invention, collateralized loan obligations, also known as CLOs. They are one of the hottest investments in the financial world, turning a bunch of risky corporate loans into a security. In the past decade, the CLO market has doubled to more than $600 billion. Here's why. Interest rates on the old standbys, like U.S. Treasuries or German government bonds, are so low that investors earn next to nothing. So while you can get less than 2% in Treasuries, a CLO can earn you more than 3% for AAA rated up to 13% or more for the riskiest investments. Of course, there's a catch. Some of the borrowers, that is companies, have spent the last decade loading up on more than $1 trillion of junk rated debt. And now almost a third of the market is on the brink of falling into the dreaded triple C tier. CLOs are discouraged from owning too much of that type of debt. So if the economy turns sour, CLOs could be drowning in ultra risky loans. And all those companies that loaded up on the debt could suddenly find themselves with fewer investors eager to lend to them. Okay, so CLOs, we got a pretty good understanding of it, and we need to understand it before or ahead of time because when we go back to 2008, even the banks, Citigroup saw no red flags even as it made bolder bets. So even a big company like Citigroup, I, I tell you what, sometimes they, they just don't, don't uh, see these things, and it's probably because they're too close to the game. Um, so back in 2007, with Wall Street confronting a crisis caused by too many souring mortgages, Citigroup executives gathered in a wood-paneled library to assess their own well-being. There, Citigroup CEO Charles O. Prince III learned for the first time that the bank owned about $43 billion in mortgage-related assets, and he asked Thomas G. Maharas, who oversaw trading at the bank, whether everything was okay. And he told his boss, no worries, no big losses were looming, according to people briefed on the meeting who would speak only on the condition that they not be named. So again, going back in time, a lot of guys say they didn't know what was coming up and, you know, whether it may or may not be true, doesn't matter because the thing is you and I need to know what's, what's coming up. And we know that, you know, th this... We know that things, you know, they, they are going to get a bit, uh, a bit dicey for us. And, and again, this goes back to, to um, the reasons why we get gold and silver. Uh, true, we do look at the gold price every day, silver price every day, but it's not the reason we, we buy. I mean, sure, we'll try to buy it at the best, most opportune time, but the reasons we buy it goes far beyond price. You know, it's it's for our families. It's again, it's for that uh, during that transition when that wealth transfer happens. You know, we we want to be in position because there are going to be opportunities there where maybe real estate's going to have to come down. You know, people are going to be selling it at a loss and, and looking for some type of money to help them get through the transition or store of value to help them get through the transition. And you know, things like gold and silver do that. You know, things like, uh, again, gold and silver, it's it's that insurance for when fiat goes bad or even during the transition. I mean, if you just look all around the world today, you know, started off with Lebanon. I mean, look at what's happening there, $1,000 per week now. I mean, it, it's 
still pretty good, but just the fact that they, they had to limit it. You, know, you take a look at Iran, you take a look at Hong Kong, you, you take a look at Chile. You know, things are really, you know, starting to heat up all over the place. And, um, you know, Europe, U.S., Middle East, Asia, wherever it is, you know, it we're all in the same boat together. And that one universal thing that we all know as being money is gold and silver and and that's another reason why you want to be holding some some gold and silver so i'll take a look at a few more comments uh before we head out um pablo pina you're welcome uh you're welcome i, I hope you know we all understand clo's a bit better now and, and we'll keep an eye on it keep an eye on the federal reserve why they're buying so much mortgage-backed securities and why they're not selling them you know are they watching the the bank's balance sheets who knows um again is it going to deutsche bank the repo market money going to deutsche bank who knows is it going to oil industry who knows is it going to farmers who knows we that's the thing who knows we don't know and, and so again you got to be your own bank at this point uh rumple steel skin the fed is bailing the banks out now very well could be very well could be uh Bartos G, first time I've seen you here. Welcome aboard. ABC, ammo, beans, and cans. <laughs> hey, I'm laughing, but it's true. <laughs> it, it very well could be true. Uh, let's see. RR, it's financial alchemy. Absolutely. A Frankenstein monster that will come back to haunt us. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, let's see. Richard De Bono, Bible says that people will be throwing their gold and silver in the streets. Are you able to describe what scenario could cause that to happen? Well, I think you folks saw that that in the comments section. Um, you know, it for you guys that know, you know, <laughs> scripture and whatnot. You know, it, that comes in what they call the day of the Lord, which is basically the end, pretty much the end. Um, uh, but before that, you're going to have things like tribulation. Um. You won't be throwing your gold and silver in the street during the, during that time uh, because that's when it'll it could probably help you the most if you know so um it, it, there are different sequences and and that one that you're talking about is more of the end sequence there are things that happen before that where you are not going to be throwing your gold and silver in the street because that is one thing that is going to be helping you um let's see so again uh thank you guys uh, thank you guys for being here. Um, okay, so that'll do it. I'll, I'll be I'll be wrapping it up. Uh, hope to see you guys next week. And um, you know, again, we're all in this boat together. Be a blessing, not a burden. And as always, saddle up for what's coming ahead and silver up. You guys take care, and I'll see you next week.